Let's bring in gun violence expert, Dr. Jonathan Metzl. He's also a professor of sociology and psychiatry at Vanderbilt University. We've talked now, uh, Jonathan, two days in a row. We talked about the hearing today. I know you've been paying close attention. We've also talked about how you have witnessed firsthand um, the, the pressure, the gun lobby pressure on these politicians. And we listen to hearings like this and we sit back and we think, yeah, that's how we feel, we feel too. All this testimony, it's gut-wrenching and we want to see something get done and there's so much talk. But then when it comes down to it, the power of, of gun manufacturers and, and, and gun ownership and gun organizations, they really have a tremendous impact on these law, lawmakers at the end of all this. And then it goes nowhere. I mean, that, that really is the story. I mean, what we need now is a real honest negotiation to listen to those incredible stories. I mean, I agree that the, that the victims' stories are remarkable, and th these are the stories of the people who lived or survived or lost children. But we don't hear from the people who, who didn't survive, the children, the shoppers, all the people. Um, and so it's, it's just the power of this. I, I mean, just we're, we're in a... A democracy, a pluralistic democracy, how can we not just sit around the table and figure out some kind of answer? And as we were talking about before, that's what other, that's what other countries and societies faced with this kind of crisis have done before. The only problem in our system is that um, half of, you know, really the, the people who are probably the most important participants, the NRA who, who represent uh, and the GOP who represent many, many gun owners who are, of course, are important, important players here, um, they're they're coming to the table not really being able to negotiate. And I've seen that firsthand as we were talking about yesterday in, in some of our interactions in Tennessee. And even as recently as a, a couple of weeks ago, a politician from New York, from Buffalo, New York, said, I'm a Republican, but to heck with it. Let, let's talk about um, uh, regulating assault weapons. And he now has a price to pay in terms of having the entire political apparatus turning on him uh, to say basically you're a traitor to our cause. And so it's what we need now is an honest negotiation among victims and concerned citizens and gun owners and politicians. And unfortunately, yet again, even though I do feel like something is different now and there, I wanna hold out the possibility of change, but it does feel like we're not having the kind of honest conversation that we need to be having about what can we do to, to make sure this doesn't happen again. So it sounds like the GOP needs to get honest with itself. I mean, from what you just explained and described, is this a GOP problem? It, it's hard because, I mean, I, I study this in Tennessee, right? And I've also seen firsthand that it's, it's an effective way of winning elections, mobilizing voter bases. I mean, the NRA is really, really powerful, not just because it gives money into the political system, which it does um, to, to, to a great extent. It's also powerful because it can mobilize a committed base of gun owners who the minute they say this politician is selling us out, they can put up a couple of billboards. That's what we've seen in Tennessee. And that person won't get past the primary. And so in a way, even politicians who want to do the right thing pay a price because the NRA and and other gun organizations and the GOP are all intertwined and they're so effective at making there be a real cost for any kind of compromise. And so in addition to all the anger and frustration now, I think the Democrats and the gun reform side need to really say, um, we're gonna turn this into a viable voting wedge issue that will get people to vote. If, there's, if we can support, um, if politicians don't support gun reform, um, we're gonna, we're gonna vote them out or something like that. If you can follow through with those kind of promises and there really is a price to pay in places where there are a lot of guns, I think that's when you'll see some real change. But unfortunately, this is from before the mass shootings. We just don't have that system right now, but hopefully we're on our way to, to getting there. So there was one testimony from a member of Women for Gun Rights. She says that gun laws just aren't working. Take a listen, I wanna get your reaction. Our gun control lobbyists and politicians claim that their policies will save lives and reduce violence. Well, those policies did not save my son. The laws being discussed are already implemented in cities across this country. We have decades of evidence proving they do not work. 
St. Louis, New York, Chicago, Washington, Atlanta are gun control utopias, and they are plagued with the most violence. All right, so she just listed states with some of the strictest gun laws. If laws aren't working, then what else can be done to address this? Well, I mean, I, I have a lot of empathy, and actually I agree with some of the things she said, that she was a mother of a gun violence uh, victim, um, and also, as I understand it, someone speaking for Turning Point uh, USA, a, um, a quite conservative pro-gun uh, and other cause uh, organization. And so, you know, I, I think it's something we need to debate. I, I, I disagree, honestly, with respect with much of what she said. I think that if you, I, I wrote a book called Dying of Whiteness, and I just looked at the impact of overturning gun laws. I compared um, Missouri, Kansas City, where I'm from, with Connecticut, two locales that made very different decisions about um, gun rights versus gun reform. And my data was incredibly clear that just overturning gun laws um, led to much more shooting and death, not just mass shootings or homicides, but more gun suicides, more partner violence. Um, and so in my data, Connecticut's turn toward enacting tighter gun reform saved, as I argue in my book, in the period I looked at, 11,000 lives. Um, and conversely, in, in Missouri, who overturned almost all their gun laws, Kansas City is a perfect example. That's my hometown. Uh, the minute they made it incredibly easy for everybody just to arm themselves in self-defense, um, every kind of gun death went up. And so I don't agree that gun laws don't work. I don't agree with that at all. The, it, the issue is if you have tight gun laws in a place like Chicago, but you're surrounded by states like Indiana and Wisconsin where you can just drive a minivan, load up with guns and drive back, basically there's no regulation. You're not gonna be able to control guns in, in a place like Chicago. Also, of course, ghost guns, other kinds of guns. And so really what we see is a patchwork of policies um, by themselves, in and of themselves, I do think gun, gun laws are effective. I do also think that speaker made an important point about race and gun laws, and certainly um, communities of color have borne the brunt of gun laws. So I do think she was making an important point about racism and gun laws, which is something our side needs to address. But I don't agree that because there's gun crime and gun death in urban areas, therefore gun laws are not effective. In fact, I think really I could show pretty convincingly with my with my research that the opposite is the case. All right, that's our next segment then, gun laws that do work, all right? I'm booking ahead right now, full transparency. We're gonna talk about that. Um, mental health, I've gotta hit this while I have you. You're also a psychiatrist, okay? So mental health, gun violence, clearly a connection here. What are we not talking about? What, what This has to be addressed as well. It's not just about gun violence laws or, or, or gun reform laws, rather. It's also about mental health. How, how, how do we work this in? We have a mental health crisis in our country, um, children in particular with the pandemic, um, issues like gun crime, polarization in this country, and, and also we have a limited access to mental health services. So I certainly support more more mental health service in school and just for our society. I think it should be funded um, equitably by insurance companies and, and health programs. So certainly as a psychiatrist, I'm, I'm gonna be always, I'm always gonna be arguing for more mental health care. Um, the issue is that the way we talk about mental health in the, in the aftermath of mass shootings is, is kind of problematic a lot of times for a couple of reasons. One is that we assume that mental illness was the one thing driving mass shooters. And when you tell the story of what happens in a mass shooting, there are so many other factors, access to guns, history of misogyny or racism, um, social networks, past history of violence, so many other factors lead. So we're, what we're doing is we're cherry picking mental illness from a bunch of other factors that then get pushed into the background. Um, and so I think that's part of it. And the other issue is there are 55,000 gun deaths a year in this country. Maybe 700 die hor horrifically by mass shootings, but that leaves over 44,000 gun deaths that don't really link to mental illness whatsoever. Everyday gun violence is much more about access to guns, um, substances, gun laws, all these other factors. So what we're doing is we're saying that because these few mass shootings had mental illness as a factor, therefore we're going to um, say that all gun death links to mental illness, and that's simply not the case. And I guess the last point is, 
as a psychiatrist, I can't help but think of all the mental illness we're creating in this country by the fear of people sending their kids to school and, and worrying about whether they might be harmed or kids themselves in school. Uh, and so we're creating a lot of mental illness um, through our inability to address the gun issue. And I think all these things, again, are things we need to put on the table as we try to come toward common cause and figure out what to do next. And we will little by little talk about everything that we have laid out on that table for sure. Dr. Jonathan Metzl, thank you so much. We'll talk soon. Thanks so much. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.